Hello and welcome to Quadcast. This is the second season of Quadcast. After our summer break, we're very excited to be back with you. We are four barristers from Quadrant Chambers in London. That is me, Paul Downs, Poonam Mawani, Joe Sullivan and Claudia Wilmot-Smith. Uh, this is Quadcast. It's a cross between a webinar and a podcast. We basically gather live Thursdays at five o'clock and talk about legal stuff, argue about what's right and what's wrong. And so, and the format, uh, who am I going to ask? Joe, what's the format? Well, the format is that we have a chat, we um, occasionally have a drink, and we, we argue with each other about what the, what the law is on various, various topics. Um, so, well, we haven't been around for three months, and the last time we were broadcasting, we were live at Poonam's holiday home, on the Suffolk coast, which was wonderful, Poonam. That was a fantastic, memorable. I remember that for the rest of my life. It was brilliant. Sorry, um, but, tell you what, it was not my holiday home. It was rented before you think I, I own that. I wasn't going to say that. that. This spectacular uh, residence. Um, Poonam, what's been your highlight, though, of the summer? Not a lot, given lockdown and the inability to travel, because I haven't left the country. But my highlight has been my children and the fact that they're as bonkers as me. And because, Paul, you asked for a photograph, Ben, can we get the photograph of my son's 23rd birthday party, socially distanced, being beer pong party, where you had to fancy dress to match your beer pong partner, hence my four 20-year-old sons looking ridiculous. <laughs> Claudia, my love, have you had a good summer? What was your highlight? I have. So... I spent most of lockdown feeling really jealous of Poonam and her garden, which you just saw. Uh, but I felt smug there where she was talking about not leaving the country. I escaped to Italy, which was great. I went away with my brother and sister-in-law and spent two weeks outside. I so miss being outside. So it was bliss. Um, how about you, Paul? Well, my news is I just wanted a big mention to everybody who did the Tour de Law charity event last week, which I took place in. I've got a photograph of me on my bike. This is in Victoria Park. Leamington Spa, where I did the last day, 100 kilometres, just going round and round and round. But, I mean, some of the cyclists were absolute heroes. I do, I do want to give a mention to a guy, Matt Trafford, at Jones Day. He cycled in seven days, can you believe it, 1,542.9 kilometres. That, um, that is 220 kilometres a day. That is absolutely fantastic. So I want to say a big shout out to all those people who took part. But Joe, Joe hasn't got any news, he told us this week, and he couldn't come up with a photo. So um, we've selected a photo for Joe to speak to. Joe, I've got some news for you. Have a look at this photo. Oh, <laughs> absolutely not. Oh, that is cold. That's, that's, that's unacceptable. <laughs> For those who don't know, Joe is a Liverpool fan. When was that game, Joe? It doesn't matter when that game was. I blanked that game from my memory. Fake news! Seeing, seeing Virgil van Dijk's face makes me even sadder because he got a cruciate injury last week. So thanks a lot for that, Paul. I'm, basically, I'm going to be miserable now for the whole of the rest of this quadcast and possibly Just, the week. What, more, more miserable. More miserable. Yeah, even more miserable than usual. Anyway, let's forget all about that, Paul. What are we talking about this week? We are, what are we talking about? We're talking about arbitration this week. We're looking at two cases, Enker versus Ooh and Halliburton. And Enker versus Ooh Insurance. Uh, this is uh, what I mean. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going back to the wrong well, I'll tell you there. what the facts are, Paul. The facts are Thanks. it's a fire at a power plant in Russia. And the uh, Chubb Insurance, who's subrogated to uh, the construction contract, issued proceedings in Russia. But the contract had an arbitration called London Arbitration. And the counterparty, Enka, started an arbitration in London and applied for an anti-suit injunction to stop the Russian proceedings. Uh, and so the case, which has gone up to the Supreme Court, was uh, ab about the anti-suit injunction, but in particular about what system of law governs the arbitration agreement itself. Um, it's P Poonam, um, we're talking about a few different questions here, aren't we? 
We are, because where you have a contract with an arbitration clause, you've got potentially three different systems of law for different parts. You've got the law of the main contract. Then, because, as we all know, the doctrine of separability, the arbitration clause, although in the contract, is legally regarded as a separate contract. So that contract, the arbitration agreement, may have a different law. And then finally, you've got the law of the seat, wherever the arbitration is, also known as the curial law, and that will govern things like the supervisory functions of the court. So you've got these three different things. When it comes to the proper law of the arbitration agreement, why is that important? Well, enormously so, because the proper law of the arbitration agreement determines, for example, the validity of the agreement. Does the arbitration agreement have to be in writing? It determines the scope of the agreement. For example, do tortious claims fall within it? Is it all-encompassing, like we in England say, after Fiona Trust? Who's bound by it? Are assignees bound by the clause? Are subrogated insurers bound? And all of this was very important in the Enker and Chubb case because the claims that were being made there were tortious claims by subrogated insurers. So how do you determine what the proper law of the arbitration agreement is. And you can't go to Rome 1 because Rome 1 specifically excludes arbitration agreements from its scope. And so now if we could get a slide up just to show you a triangular thing. So you've got the main contract on the right side of the slide. You've got the arbitration seat. So they might say arbitration in London or LMA arbitrators or whatever. Then you've got the arbitration agreement up there at the top of the triangle. And the question is, because I don't think I've ever seen a contract which specifies the proper law of the arbitration agreement. So do you get the proper law of the arbitration agreement from the main contract or do you get it from the seat? We can take that slide down. And that's really what's divided commentators and the authorities uh, for a long time. Um, the Court of Appeal judgment in Enkin Chubb was um, given by Lord Justice Popperwell, and he said in it uh, that the time had come to impose some order and clarity on the law, uh, and that the disarray of the authorities uh, was not giving any credit to um, our commercial law. When the case went to the Supreme Court, their lordships agreed that the time came, has come, to give some order and clarity the slight problem is they completely disagreed with the Court of Appeal as to what the right order and clarity was. Um, what the Court of Appeal said in a straightforward, clear answer was they said the proper law of the arbitration agreement is the seat, the seat, the seat. You take the same law. So if it says English arbit arbitration in England, that's the proper law of the, of the arbitration agreement. And really, essentially, their view was that you don't change the law on the arbitration side of, of the equation. The agreement, it's supervisory function, everything should be the same, therefore it's the seat. They allowed for one exception. They said possibly, but in a very minority of cases, where you have an express choice of law of the main contract, but also other factors that suggest that the parties intended the main law of the arbitration, the law of the main contract, to also apply to the arbitration agreement, then that contract law might apply, but they thought that would be in a very few cases. So seat, seat, seat. But Claudia, what did the Supreme Court think of all of that? Well, the Supreme Court didn't just agree, uh, disagree with the Court of Appeal, they also disagreed with each other. So there was a 5-3 split. The majority judgment was given by Lords Hamlin and Leggett and Lord Carr agreed with them. And then Lords Burroughs and Sales gave minority judgments. Just to be clear, 5-3 f split or? 3-2. 3-2 split, sorry. It was, a five, it was a five member panel. The split was 3-2. That was maths in my head. <laughs> so yeah, so um, Lord Burroughs being in a minority of two, as a Liverpool fan with Joe knows what it's like to be a, a two loser. Um, but yeah, so they disagree with each other. Um, and it was a 115 page judgment. And not only did they all disagree with each other, we have all read this judgment and spent the past week furiously disagreeing between us as to what's interesting about this, what's important about it, why it's relevant. So in the interest of clarity, I'm just gonna show you a slide and show you what they said. Um, the first thing you have to work out is the proper law of the main contract. And that's the left-hand column. 
if it's been expressly chosen, the Court of Appeal said it's the seat, uh, the proper law of the arbitration agreement will be the seat. Same as being clearly demonstrated or if they haven't chosen it. The minority, so we're going on, over to the right side, said the proper law of the main contract is the main thing. So it will be shared by the proper law of the arbitration agreement in all cases, whether that proper law has been expressly chosen, whether it's been clearly demonstrated by other circumstances or whether it hasn't been chosen, you've just been fixed by Article Four of their own convention. So the majority, which is highlighted because the majority make the law, and that's a majority of three, not a majority of five, which could be important if it goes up again, actually, um, said that if you expressly choose or a choice has been clearly demonstrated, that law of the main contract will also be the law of the arbitration agreement. But where the parties haven't chosen the law and you've determined it in accordance with Article 4, then the arbitration agreement will be governed by the law of the seat because they say the seat is the, the law of the seat is the law to which the arbitration agreement is most closely connected. So if we're bringing clarity, the thing that you need to work out when you're looking at a contract and there's no express choice of law is whether you are in a case where you clearly demonstrated the choice of law and so therefore there's been an implied choice or whether there's no choice express or implied have i got it right let me take the slide down yeah let me just make sure i've got this right so if the main contract yeah contains a choice of law yeah what all we need to remember is that that choice of law will also apply to the arbitration agreement so, yeah and doesn't that sound beautifully simple right but step two is if the main contract doesn't have a choice of law, then the, arbit the law of the arbitration agreement will go 3-2 in the Supreme Court to the seat, exactly. not to the main contract. Exactly. Got it. And okay. so, and that sounds very simple, uh, but it's not always simple. If there's not an express choice of law, and this is something Poonam and I have been talking about because... It's, it's not always clear, right, whether you've there's an implied choice of law or whether the law of the main contract is one that's, like, fixed by all the circumstances of the case. No, close uh, The facts of the, the, what happened in the Supreme Court in Anchor shows you that itself. Right. On the question of whether there was an implied choice, so therefore you go to contract, three of them said, uh, two of them said there is an implied choice, so you go to contract, but three of them said there's no employed choice. You have to go look at close connection. And, you, know, we've had, you got the same answer, right? They all agreed Russia, yeah. which shows that you can get the same law in two different ways. And usually you think that doesn't matter, right? Because either way, you're at Russian law. But this shows why it might matter, which lane you've got. Well, let me let me just ask go around because we've got some some pretty heavyweight brains applying their mind to this. And to have a 3-2 split implies that there's room for reasonable minds to disagree. So I want to ask, uh, so the question is, the main contract's silent, no choice of law in the main contract. Obviously, the arbitration agreement doesn't have a choice of law. They never do. So are you with the minority, which said that the arbitral law, the law of the arbitration agreement should go with the main contract, in this case to Russia, or are we? Are you with the majority that says the choice of law in that case should go to the seat of arbitration in London? Poonam? I'm with the minority. Uh, for me, I agree with them that although the arbitration agreement is a separate contract, what all their lordship said was that's a bit of a legal fiction uh, to do with other things. It's all part of the same contract and they wouldn't expect different, you know, they'd expect a law that applies to the main contract to apply to the arbitration agreement. And for me, that's the case, whether there's an implied choice or it's close connection. I don't see why we suddenly change and go off to the seat um, in, in the last scenario. So I'm with the minority. Joe? I'm with the majority. I mean, I see that practical problem, but I think analytically, if you just imagine that you can very clearly tell whether there's a choice whether it's expressed or implied or not, then if there's no choice at all, but you know the one thing they have decided is that they want to arbitrate in London, then it seems to me that it's sensible that that's the English law should govern the arbitration agreement. Uh, so as a matter of analysis, it seems to me the majority is right, although I take your point about the practical problems. 
That sounds more like you're agreeing with the Court of Appeal, though, than the... Yeah, pro- probably, yeah. 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 Claudia, what do you think? I disagree. I'm with Lord Burroughs. I mean, I think the example he gives is a good one, right? You could have a dispute resolution clause that includes, for example, an obligation to mediate. And is that obligation part of the arbitration agreement or part of the main contract? Like, I just think the, the law with which it's most closely connected is the law of the contract. It's part of that contract. See, I thought when I first tried to get my head around all this, I thought that you'd go with the main contract because the logic of if there's a choice of law in the main contract, it applies to the arbitration agreement. That made sense to me. So I thought, well, if you just follow the main contract. But thinking about it, I, I do think the majority are right because if you, if you in paragraph 142 of the judgment, they talk about this, the motives of the parties in choosing arbitration in London in that case is because they're looking for a venue for the arbitration, for the dispute resolution, which is away from their, the, 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 the dispute, away from the Russia, away from those things. They're looking for independence. They're looking for neutral ground. And if that's their mindset, they're likely to have wanted the law of that neutral venue to apply as well to the arbitral Ooh. process. Did you say neutral ground, London arbitration? Did that segue nicely into our Halliburton case? I, it may well do. I thought you were going to say, what are you talking about, Paul? Talking a load of rubbish, but anyway. No, sorry, that's yeah. right. Well, okay, I'll say, I will say why, why, what a load of rubbish, because if that's the thinking, you'll be rather surprised that the parties then haven't chosen expressly for a choice of law to govern the main contract that's not Russia, you know, and chosen an express choice of law to govern the main contract or an exclusive jurisdiction clause for all issues. It might just but anyway, not- I, go on, go on, Joe. Well, they just might might have not not thought about it that clearly, but that's part of the isn't that part of the thing about just ascertaining what their real intention was when they haven't expressed it. You're trying. You've got part of the jigsaw, and you're trying to work out the missing pieces. And the missing pieces, I think, it sound re- well, paragraph one four two. Penham, have a read of it. You you might change. Uh, <laughs> Halliburton, Paul. Halliburton. We're on to Halliburton. Um, so this is the case that we haven't got a judgment on. And it's been, I mean, Joe, what's going on? Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's another one of those cases where we've been waiting. It, it, it was in front of the Supreme Court in November last year, uh, still no judgment. So it sounds like something quite interesting might, might be about to happen on it. Um, but uh, Claudia, what are the facts? Well, the deep background to this was the Deepwater Horizon disaster. It wasn't intentional, that's all. Very good. Um, but it was a rig owned by Transocean, leased by BP, and Halliburton had provided cement and well monitoring services. After it blew up, obviously, everybody claimed against all of them. Uh, a bunch of proceedings brought in the US about all, against all of them. Many were consolidated. Liability was apportioned by the courts. Shortly before judgment, Halliburton settled those claims. Shortly after judgment, Transocean settled those claims. Both Halliburton and Transocean were insured by Trump, uh, Trump? By Chubb. <laughs> Last debate tonight, by Trump. Uh, materially the same form, product liability insurance on the Bermuda form, both claimed on their policies. Chubb declined liability against both for largely the same reason, saying it didn't have to pay either, not reasonably settled. They both commenced arbitration. Halliburton commenced first, appointed an arbitrator. Chubb appointed their arbitrator. M uh, was appointed by the court as the chairman, of, or chair, chairwoman, I should say, um, being famously played by Judy Dench in the James Bond movies. So we have <laughs> Judy Dench as chair, chair, chairwoman of the tribunal, and Chubb then... And is, this, is, is this a secret? We're not allowed to know who M is? He's just told, told you it's Judy, Judy Dench. Dench. <laughs> <laughs> I'm she not going to say it. I don't worry, I'm not going to say it. The second defendant is not named. But right. the second defendant is a London arbitrator with a very good reputation, we're told. And that right. was... Um, and everyone thinks that this is, you know, this is a good arbitrator who is very fair. But when he was appointed as Chubb's arbitrator in the Halliburton reference, he did not disclose to Halliburton um, that he was there. Uh, he was the arbitrator in the Transocean reference. And so when Halliburton found out that there was one arbitrator sitting in two references to which Chubb was a party to both and Halliburton was a party to only one. Uh, Well, that that kicked off this claim, basically. They said that he should have disclosed to them that he'd been appointed 
by Chubb in the Transocean reference and that he was in breach of duty and that the arbitrator should also be ordered to step down from the tribunal because... Can I just get it right? So the first reference, there's nothing to disclose because nothing's happened yet. Mm -hmm. The second reference, he discloses to the second reference the first reference, but when he does that... He doesn't just go back to the first reference and say, oh, by the way, I've now been appointed in this other second. He does not. Right. And because the arbitration is confidential, Halliburton do not know that he is sitting in this other reference. Yeah. Um, got it. Why does it matter, Joe? Why do we care? Uh, you're muted, Joe. I'm so sorry. I, I, it's a tricky area. Um, I, I should say that I think anyone who wants to comment on any of the points that we're making can do so on the YouTube channel or by or by emailing to the usual address i mean it's an area that obviously it triggers a lot of policy considerations for obvious reasons and it's it's sensitive because of london's position in the in the arbitration market and not wanting to prejudice that position but but happily we have i think punam someone who knows an awful lot about this to help us this week yes i'm very excited to welcome our very first guest on quadcast and that is sir nigel tear oh god he's just popped up between us hello nigel hi punam uh, i'm sure our viewers don't need any introduction but uh, nigel was um admiralty and commercial court judge for some 14 years he stepped down this summer and is now sitting as an arbitrator at Arbitrators at Term of Fleet Street. So really, there could be no more perfect person uh, than Nigel to discuss the issues raised in Halliburton and also how they affect issues of apparent bias with the judiciary and court proceedings. Nigel, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a personal question first, since I've got you and you can't refuse. Um, as a judge, did you ever have to sort of make disclosure of anything to the parties before hearing the case? Uh, yes, Poonam. Uh, there are at least, I think, uh, two occasions I can recall. Uh, the first was when uh, I realised that uh, my pension fund had a shareholding in one of the parties before me. So I declared that, but no doubt because the shareholding was rather small, both parties uh, said there was no problem and we continued. Uh, the second was uh, I, I declared that uh, one of the solicitors in the case, whose conduct was subject to some uh, comment in the case, was someone who uh, had not only instructed me at the bar, I didn't regard that as significant, but was someone that I, I saw socially, as it were, um, and often travelled uh, in on the train with him. Uh, I felt that I should disclose that, uh, and I did so. But again, um, uh, both parties said we could happily continue. And there have been other occasions, but it, it, it does happen quite a bit. Um, but I, fine. I'm just trying to think, with, with the issue with the guy on the train, that you might be seen on the same train coming into London while the hearing was going on, was that... Uh, it, that would be a consideration, certainly. I, I, I think um, once he'd gone into the witness box, I certainly <laughs> couldn't see him on the train. But um, I, it was a more general consideration. And I just thought that uh, since I knew him socially and bumped into him from time to time, uh, it, and his conduct was under some comment, yeah. I, I should disclose it. OK, so we haven't actually told our viewers what the decisions um, in Halliburton were uh, before, while we're waiting for the Supreme Court. But in short order, Ms. Justice Popperwell at first instance held that M was quite okay not to have disclosed that he was an arbitrator in, in two overlapping arbitrations, and therefore unsurprisingly also held that there was no need to um, remove him and there was no justifiable grounds for so doing. The Court of Appeal disagreed on the first point. Uh, they accepted that uh, M should have disclosed the overlapping appointments uh, because they said that fact might cause people to have concerns. But 
they also refused to remove him uh, because they said they were satisfied that a reasonably objective observer would not uh, think that there were justifiable concerns. And, and a big point of it was that they said you can trust this arbitrator uh, to put extraneous matters from the other arbitration out of their head and just focus on the information in the arbitration that's in front of them and put it all out. Nigel, talking about arbitration first, and I think we'll come on to whether the judiciary differs. What, what's your view about whether people can put things out of their mind, whether it's okay to have overlapping appointments in this way without disclosing? Well, well if um, uh, you're asking me to comment on the second part of the uh, Supreme uh, the, 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 the decision, yeah. uh, namely whether or not uh, there having been a failure to disclose, as the Court of Appeal said, there was, uh, what is the consequence of that? Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, considered that uh, although there had been that failure, um, for various reasons, it wasn't sufficiently grave or important to require uh, the arbitrator um, uh, to stand down. Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, pointed out that it was uh, an accidental omission uh, that there was very little overlap between the two cases. And as you've said, uh, the arbitrator could be expected to do his best to keep an open mind. Um, there is, uh, and this was advanced in the argument uh, in the Supreme Court, a Privy Council decision concerning uh, a retired High Court judge, Peter Cresswell, uh, sitting in uh, one of the Caribbean jurisdictions and trying a case uh, where uh, there was a Qatari party, and he at the time also being a judge appointed to sit in Qatar. And uh, the court there again held there'd been a failure to disclose, but although the um, failure was accidental, and although uh, any bias could only be an unconscious bias, uh, it took a, a rather strict view of the uh, duty to disclose and its importance. And I can't help feeling that there is a contrast between that approach and the decision of the Court of Appeal. And given that arbitration is private and confidential, uh, given that um, you have party appointees, uh, there does seem to me to be quite a strong argument to the effect that uh, in arbitration at any, uh, uh, in these circumstances, uh, the highest standards should be uh, not only applied, but seen to be applied. And uh, therefore, I think there's a quite a real prospect the appeal might succeed. Don't you, don't you think that... Um, if you set the bar too low, you make it too easy for a party that's for whatever, whatever reason wants to disrupt the arbitration, wants to unseat the arbitrator, it feels it's going badly for them, whatever is the motivation. If you set the bar too low, they can seize on the slightest um, oversight on the part of the tribunal and then attack it and, and get rid of them. And you could undermine the integrity of the process by a different route. Um, when you say the slightest oversight, um, it's difficult. Uh, what one can see that an oversight might be described as slight when it's accidental. But I think one has to have regard to what it is that has not been disclosed. And on the facts of that case, uh, what was not disclosed um, could, as the Court of Appeals say, be regarded by a perfectly responsible party uh, uh, as something which um, needs to be investigated. So uh, I, I quite agree with your concern, but I don't really think it arises on the facts of Halliburton. Also goes to timing, right? Because if you have to disclose it at the beginning when you're appointed, there's only so much the process can be uh, derailed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the earlier there is disclosure, uh, if, it, if that which has been disclosed does give rise a problem, 
then there's a very early opportunity to resolve it. Although I suppose there may be cases where the factual overlap isn't apparent right at the start, but then becomes apparent through the course of the of the arbitration. Well, I think I think there. I mean, in, in Halliburton, although it was thought that ultimately there wasn't much of an overlap, nevertheless it concerned the very same factual scenario, and concerned the very same uh, insurance contract. So the same terms. So um, uh, the, the argument that one can wait and see was discussed in, in that case. But uh, again, if one is seeking to ensure that people have the utmost confidence in the arbitral procedure, uh, it may very well be that uh, not only should there be disclosure, but if there isn't, it has the effect that um, one has to have an, another member of the tribunal. Well, also, particularly when we're talking about overlapping issues like this, if there is disclosure of the fact that they exist, then the parties can take stock, particularly the one that's not common, and ask for things like cons agreement to consolidation or concurrency, can ask for disclosure yeah. to be passed up the chain. If they're not told uh, of the fact, because there's no disclosure, they can't even try to, to, you know, to, to make suggestions as to how to make it work. And, you know, Paul says they might use the smallest thing to derail. Well, if having had it disclosed to them, the tribunal and the other party was willing to have it consolidated, all evidence, then an, a complaint uh, that they should be removed for apparent bias would have much less force. Yeah. So more cards on the table to make the system work better. So I, I can't see the argument against having to disclose in these circumstances um, at all. Paul, you're sceptical. I mean, Nigel said he thinks there's a good prospect of the appeal succeeding. Why are you so sceptical? No, I'm not. I, 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 I Initially, I thought that it was um, a dangerous sort of route to go down because judicially there's no problem with a judge hearing two related cases. But I take the point that it's arbitration is confidential, so it's slightly different. What, can I ask uh, Sir Nigel this? What what about this thing about arbitrators taking repeat instructions from the same clients, you know, over and over again? Isn't there a danger there of unconscious bias? Uh, well, there might be, but it requires, um, I would have thought, a, a, a very considerable number of appointments before you get to that stage. Well, actually, um, in in the case. The judgment of the Court of Appeal records they must have put to um, counsel uh, who was alleging apparent bias or what, how many repeat appointments. I, I don't know how carefully everyone was right. He conceded that a certain number ten. would get. Yeah. yeah, I was going to play a game for him. Uh, sorry. The number was 10, everyone. Really, um, Well, I was trying to find the reference in the Court of Appeal just now. It's, number, it, it's 10. Was that the. Which actually, Nigel, I think in the arbitral world and, and saying the shipping world there, that's quite a small number. There'll be lots of arbitrators who would have accepted many more than 10 arbitrate appointments from the same party in, in the shipping world. From the same party or the same solicitor? I think in this case it was party, you're right. There'll be a yeah. difference between party and solicitor. I, mean, I, I think 10 appointments from the same party no doubt can occur, but... Uh, there are a large number of arbitrators these days, and uh, it may often be that you, you won't reach that number. Was that a plug for you, Nigel? Because there is one new person on the block, which everybody is right here. <laughs> well, with, all, with all these arbitrators having to declare their interest and resign from cases, I think there's a real gap in the market. <laughs> retired, retired judges need to step up to the plate. they make killing. <laughs> Oh, one can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, uh, Sir Nigel, thank you very much indeed for joining us. The first ever uh, guest on Quadcast. I think that will be a quiz question in years to come. <laughs> uh, certainly you deserve a place in the Guinness Book of Records, no doubt about it. Um, well, thank, <laughs> th 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 thank you all very much for inviting me. I've uh, very much enjoyed it. Um, so with that, we say goodbye to Sir Nigel. Let me just go round. Um, Sir Nigel gave his view as to where it's going to come out. Let me go round. Poonam, where do you think the result... I think you've given away your view, but where, where do you think the result will come out? 
I'm absolutely clear. I think that there should be, should have been disclosure. And I think where you fail to make disclosure, um, that should have teeth and there should, you know, will add to the grounds for power bias. So and I think the Court of Appeal, uh, the Supreme Court should uh, say M should have been recused. Claudia? Absolutely. Yeah, I was super surprised. I thought the Court of Appeal judgment was definitely wrong. And I very much hope it gets overturned by the Supreme Court. And I'm pleased that everyone's so optimistic. Joe? I agree. I think allowed. I'm going to say I think the appeal will be dismissed. I don't know how they'll do it, but I think they're going to be loath. To... You only said that because in the history of podcast, we never all thought we. <laughs> and you just to make it interesting, <laughs> Poonam. Yeah, yeah, I know you now, Paul. Got to make it interesting. Right. So um, what's left? Nothing really. Uh, I, it leaves it to me to firstly uh, plug the uh, the subscription to YouTube channel, Quadrant Chambers channel. So if you like the quadcast, well, if you like the quadcast broadcast, please like them on YouTube because that helps the algorithms and, and we get our views up. <laughs> And uh, subscribe as well. If you like the, uh, this and other, there's loads of other Quadrant Chambers programs that we're putting out, subscribe to the channel and you, then you'll get automatically notified of new and interesting uh, programs and broadcasts. Um, if you want us to remind you, uh, then email us, quadcast at quadrantchambers.com. Or if you want to ask questions for, for example, next week or the week after, email us your questions. And if we can... And if we've got time, we will try and get to them. Uh, we've got in the next two weeks, Joe, what have we got coming up in the next two weeks? So next week, we're going to be looking at the, um, the special decision of the commercial courts, Mr. Justice Butcher and Lord Justice Flo's decision on the COVID FCA business interruption insurance case, a huge decision, both in terms of length and importance, given everything that's been happening in the world. Yeah. Um, we're, we're going into tier three. Uh, yeah, we're going into tier three. All of the tiers make it relevant, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just separately from that, I think just today or maybe maybe yesterday, the commercial court has decided that all of the COVID business interruption insurance claims are going to be managed by Mr. Justice Butcher and a, a crack team of, of uh, special, specially selected judges. Um, and then the week after that, we're going to be looking at the um, the topic that keeps, you think it's dead, but it's not dead, contractual estoppel. So lots just of exciting. when you thought it was, just when you thought it was safe to go back to the exclusion clauses. Exactly right. Yeah. They're back. <laughs> exactly. So great. So that's FCA test case and contractual estoppel coming up in the next two weeks. And that leaves it just for me to say thank you, obviously, to the team. Thank you to our long-suffering producer, Emily Saunderson, and the uh, live streaming services and vision mixing by Fisheye Productions. Thank you very much. See you next time.